everyone. I'm sorry I'm really short, so I'm going to move this down as much. The way you are. Why, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so the talk of the title is Battling Unconscious Bias, but I really like calling it being a cupcake in a donut world. Um, and I say this because there's a donut emoji, and people bring in donuts for breakfast all the time, and they're just as healthy as cupcakes. So I'm just saying it's kind of unfair and biased towards cupcakes, and I really like cupcakes, so definitely have a bias against donuts. I'll still eat them. So I'd like to start this out and get everyone to close their eyes. And I'd like to say that nobody's going to steal your stuff, but that's my Midwestern trustworthiness. So I don't know how it is in New York. We'll see how this goes. Um, I'd like you to think very hard on the first thing that pops into your mind when I say a couple of different professions. So what's the first thing that pops into your mind when I say a nurse? A software developer? A teacher? Or a police officer? Or a pilot? Okay, I'm done. You can all open your eyes. And so the whole point of this was when the first time I think about a software developer, I think about my favorite tech lead who was really badass and awesome and like her picture comes into my mind. But when I think of a pilot, I don't actually know any pilots. So I think of this like cartoony pilot uh, of this like white dude with this little pilot hat. Um, and that's the first thing that I think of. And so really what your first uh, thoughts are uh, really give you an idea of what the pattern you have in your brain for different ideas and topics and peoples and professions and really generally everything. So why does this relate to bias? Bias is just a prejudice in favor of one group, person, thing, whatever, idea over another um, thing, person, or an idea. And uh, bias is a really just the way that our brain has these impressions and it helps us kind of categorize information. So scientists disagree about how many bits of information you get at every single second in a day, but it's a lot. And you're looking at people, you're taking in all of these senses. And so me standing up here right now, I could tell you that my fingers are really cold, but I can't tell you particular people's eye colors or hair colors or whatever, even though like I'm taking all of this information in. So bias really kind of saves you time and helps categorize information of like, I see a lot of people with colorful hair in the room. Like that's kind of my perception of the room. So, uh, so that's really what I'm thinking about right now. And bias is influenced by your background, your cultural environment, really everything around you. Um, so if you were stung by a bee when you were a child, you are more likely to be biased against bees. As opposed to a person who wasn't stung by a bee or doesn't live around bees, they're probably like, bees are this mythical creature that you talk about and I'm not really afraid of them. And um, generally in this talk, we're gonna talk about unconscious bias. So conscious bias are things that I'm like actively aware that I'm biased against. I'm actively biased against spiders. They freak me out, I hate them. But I'm, uh, so I'm consciously biased towards that. But unconscious bias are the things that you don't realize that you're biased against. They're the things that help you make these split decisions, but you can't actively uh, think back on your decision to be like, oh, it's exactly because of this, this, and this um, that made me biased towards this one way or another. And in this talk, we're gonna focus on that. And so the idea is that if we believe everyone has good intentions, then most of the bias falls under unconscious bias. So I'm not saying that uh, there isn't a lot of conscious bias, like the person who yelled at me one day to go back to Mexico or China because he couldn't decide which one, and I'm not either. Like, that was definitely conscious bias on his part. For sure, 100% conscious bias. I'm not going to say that this doesn't happen, and, you know, like, people have conscious biases. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how you can figure out what you're biased against that you don't even realize. So, uh... The one way uh, that people find out their biases are by taking the implicit association test. So over five million people have taken this. Um, on my next slide, I'll give you the URL for this. But the idea behind this is that you get uh, two, uh, two categories that you're trying to figure out what your bias is for. And so in this example, uh, you're trying to figure out if you're biased towards thin people or towards fat people. And what they do is they have you categorize different pictures to see how fast can you categorize things in these two categories. And then they'll start adding in words and they'll see how fast is it for you to categorize um, 
bad words are thin people or good words and fat people on the other side. And so if you uh, see the word pretty and you um, are faster at categorizing it with thin people versus other words, that kind of shows you what your biases are towards. And so uh, there are different categorizations. They, you're either not biased at all or biased uh, slightly towards one thing or really biased towards another thing. And what they found is that 70% of white people have a preference for white people, but also 50% of black people also have a preference for white people. I also find that 76% of people have a preference for able-bodied people, and 76% of people more readily associate males with careers and females with families. And so uh, at what, kind of what they say at the end of this is that you might have a preference or bias towards people, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you always act upon this. So keep that in mind. I took some of these tests when I was preparing for this talk, and I was kind of surprised about some of the results. One of the tests I took was Arab Americans versus European Americans, and I have a Muslim background, and uh, I went to a mosque all of my childhood, and mosques are similar to churches for Christians, but uh, mosques generally have like people from all over the world. Most cities only have one or two mosques, so basically like it's an amalgamation of all cultures everywhere. So I grew up with Somali friends and Afghani friends, and so I never expected to have a preference towards European people over Arab people because, you know, this is what I grew up with. I have all these fond memories, like I love seeing people in hijab, and so I was really surprised about this, and then I was talking to some friends about it, and they were like, well, I mean, you do see the news every day, right? You do see all the, well, at least in New York it says, see something, say something everywhere. And it's just like making me feel weird, like I'm not being aware of something that I should be. And it's really playing towards some of these biases that I didn't really know that I had. Uh, so, so that was kind of a shock for me to find. And it's something that I have to like actively remember and try not to act on these biases. So a couple of terminology real quick. Um, In-group is the group that you identify with. A lot of people, like I identify with uh, Bengali people. I was really excited there was another Bengali speaker. Like props to him, awesome. Um, and you generally judge those people on potential because you're like, hey, you have a similar background to me. You probably could do the same things as me. I'm awesome, so you must be awesome. We're gonna do awesome things together. The out-group, uh, symbolized by the cupcake, is the group that you don't identify with and you don't relate to these people, so you judge them on their accomplishments and you really scrutinize what they've done because they kind of have to prove to you that they're, you know, generally an awesome person because you don't really relate to them. Uh, I would talk about these terms in more detail, but Jameson was way better at explaining this than I was. But generally, intersectionality is the interconnected nature of all these social constructs. Um, somebody who has a lot more out-groups is probably more marginalized than somebody who has a lot more in-groups. And microaggressions are those subtle comments that you hear that really weigh on you after a long time. And in general, uh, sometimes bias is ridiculous, like my bias towards cupcakes is kind of ridiculous. Um, but sometimes it's really dangerous when somebody's yelling at you in the street or threatening you. That's really dangerous. And generally, it's this kind of low to high buzz that uh, makes you feel like you're worth, you know, what you are and generally affects you on a day-to-day -day level. But why, why does it really matter, right? Uh, we're all biased in some way. We all like to think we're really objective, but we're really not. And even, um, like other people have said, like a lot of marginalized groups are like, I'm the most oppressed or I have all these things. And it's like, no, we're all bias towards each other. We all uh, face oppression in different, on different levels. And so why does it matter to kind of get diverse groups? And uh, there have been a lot of studies around this. And generally, you get um, a lot more team commitment when you have a diverse team. You get 57% more collaboration because people kind of break out of this group think and they start giving dissenting opinions. And then other people feel more comfortable saying their opinions. Uh, you get more discretionary effort at work, and people like staying with diverse teams because we're pretty awesome. But let's give a real-world example of bias. So the first iPhone had the very first YouTube app, which was awesome, and 5 to 10% of videos were upside down. 
and the developers were like, what happened? We made this awesome app and five to 10% of videos are upside down. What are we doing? There must be this crazy bug. Does anyone have an idea of why this could have happened? Right, left-handed people. So it wasn't that the right-handed developers we're like, screw left-handed people, they don't exist, or we don't care about them, we only care about right-handed people. It's not like that happened. It's not like the testers were like, oh, only our users are gonna use it this way. It's one of those things that uh, people are just unaware of the biases that they have, and these things kind of come up, and then they have to pivot and try to um, change how they're doing things and try to get more perspectives. And if you're in app development in general, like there are tons of uh, things that happen like this. But this happens in all kinds of products. The first iteration of airbags killed women and children, which sucked. Uh, especially if you're a woman and child in like the early 1900s. The uh, first iteration of voice recognition software didn't hear women. Like it literally didn't hear women. And facial recognition software is still a work in progress. Like, let's be real on this. Uh, you know how Facebook tags all of your friends automatically? Your darker skin friends don't get tagged automatically. And it's literally erasing their history from Facebook because they're not getting tagged automatically. I don't go back and check this. I do now after I found out that half of my wedding party wasn't tagged in any of the photos. Um, <laughs> But like, it, these are all those things where people are like, no, it's awesome, it works for me all the time, and then you have another friend who's like, yeah, it never works for me, uh, definitely never works for me. So, so those are some real world examples of why bias really matters and why you should probably figure out what you're biased towards. So let's talk about this in hiring a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of iterations of this study, but the very premise of it is that you have two identical resumes. The only thing that's different is you put a male name on some of the resumes and you put a female name on some of the other resumes. And what they find is identical resumes, but for every eight, or for every 10 applications that they have, eight of them are recommended for hire if they have a male name versus only five of them are recommended for hire if they have a female name. Similarly, if you have a European sounding name like Brendan, Greg, Emily, and Brendan, oh wait, I already said that one, whatever, um, <laughs> versus an African American sounding name like Tamika, Rashid, Tyrone, or Aisha, uh, for every six European sounding names, you're only going to recommend four African American sounding names for hire. And what that is the equivalent of is eight years of experience. And I say that because a lot of hiring managers are in the in-group of having European sounding names. And so they're starting to judge other people's names based on their accomplishments, like we said before. And all of us have had that trouble of like trying to find the first job and every single job needs five years of experience. And you're like, I just need my first one. I can't get experience until you give it to me. So it kind of compounds like that. But a really intense statistic that I found was that uh, people with white sounding names are with criminal backgrounds are more likely to be recommended for hire than people with black or Latina names, which, ah, uh, they don't have criminal backgrounds and this is the exact same resume. Like, what, what is that? The, a similar thing happens if you have parent-teacher association versus a community-based activity. So this is amongst just women. So remember, uh, having a female name, you were less likely to be hired. But also, if you put parent-teacher association on your resume, you're also way less likely to be hired. But not only that, you, on average, are likely to get $11,000 less in the starting salary. There's less tolerance for you being late because people think it's because of your kids or whatever. And there's just a lot of maternal bias. And you haven't even been hired yet. This is just somebody looking at you and your resume based on your name. They don't even know you, they don't have a face to you, nothing. So what can we do about this? Uh, there are a lot of things that we could do in the interviewing process, but generally meeting people too. So you can structure your interviewing. And what I mean by structure your interviewing is, I mean get data-driven questions. Ask the same questions for every single candidate. Also, keep minimum qualifications so that when you have someone who's in your in-group, you don't just let it slide that they don't have a uh, certain qualification because they're similar to you. You can ask for evidence, and a lot of people have a hard time with this because they're like, well, this person didn't have open source contributions, they're lazy, instead of recognizing that they didn't have college paid for like you and they were working three jobs instead of uh, contributing to open source, things like that. 
Remove names and dates. We saw the power of names, right? But also, like, dates. I backwards calculate if somebody went to school in the 80s, and I'm like, oh, they're way older than me. And if I have an ageism bias, and I'm like, oh, they're older than me, then my ageism bias kind of says, oh, they might not be better or worse at this job. Um, understanding culture fit? Culture fit's that weird thing that all of our companies love saying that we have the best culture and everything's awesome. But you really need to get people to give you real concrete reasons and point to a, a rubric of values like, oh, this person doesn't do test-driven development. That's okay for culture fit. But not, oh, this person doesn't go and drink all the time. That's not okay for culture fit. And really get people to explain to you why. But also play the devil's advocate because we hear a lot of these things and we don't push back. So when somebody's saying, I don't think this person's going to be committed to the job, ask them if they would think that of a person who's not a mother or of a different race or a different age. This slide in general has a whole bunch of things, uh, a whole bunch of different ways uh, that we should start thinking about our bias. A lot of people say he will do this, he will do that for like a fictional person or sometimes even a class or method. Try using they instead. Um, there's a lot of talking about invisible illnesses and how you can help your team become more comfortable talking about their illnesses and helping them. We could talk about clothing and how you're, you assume somebody is more or less technical based on their clothing. But this isn't a comprehensive list, but there are a lot of different things that we do that play into this. Like even with clothing of free shirts, do we make sure we have sizes for everyone? I was on a team where half of the people didn't have the same size of sh or couldn't get a shirt because they were too large for the sizes that they had. And so they felt left out. And we don't want anyone to feel left out, right? At the end of the day, we want everyone to feel included. So try to think of all the things that you accidentally disclude people with. But at the, there's a lot of things that we can do. And the first thing really is listening and believing and acknowledging that this happens. A lot of people will say, oh, that's so crazy, or I can't believe that happened to you. And that makes me as a person feel like you actually don't believe it happened. So instead of going to those go-to things to say, start saying, oh, I believe you, and I'm really sorry that happened. Just change the way that you react to things. You can challenge and counter stereotypes all the time, especially when you recognize that you have these stereotypes. Um, and you can do that through becoming a scientist of your own behavior. Start thinking like, oh, okay, I've been doing, um, I had this really strong first impression because this person had an accent, a southern accent, and is it because I associate southern accents with not being as intelligent? Oh God, I recognize that's my bias and really I need to rethink this first impression. And be aware of the impact, right? The impact is that we don't feel included in our teams and we don't want to come to work. So try to be aware of that and try not to do that to other people. Uh, the biggest thing that I really want, the, la the second to last two things, is really see who's in your group. Do you have people of a variety of ethnicities, races, every like everything um, and if you don't don't go up to a person and be like hey I don't have a lesbian friend we should be friends don't do that <laughs> go to somebody and be like I like that you also like cupcakes and I think we should be friends based on that like that's how you create authentic relationships with people don't single people out because they meet some checkbox nobody wants to meet a checkbox it sucks but also check the context of your information. I will hear people all the time, especially in St. Louis, which is very close to Ferguson, say things like, that crazy black woman in the mall, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, why did you say she was a black woman? Like, what did that have to do with this whole story? You're trying to put some, like, fill in some information without explicitly saying it. So really think about what you're saying. And like, is race important? Is gender important in any of these things? Why can't you just say that person, right? Are you trying to make me fill in these stereotypes and think more things and like fill in the picture of the story? But at the end of the day, be an active bystander. Figure out what your biases are. Help other people. Go back to your companies and say, hey, I want you to figure out hiring in a better way. And go back and start making these changes because it's really hard to do as one person. But as everyone's been saying, the more momentum you get, the better it ends up being. But also eat a lot more cupcakes too. So. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.